I would like to welcome you formally to our second annual conference. Sadly, only our second, because we were taken out by that little thing called the pandemic in the first couple of years. Uh, I just want to assure you that, uh, as somebody who takes an interest in travelling around the world and looking at what's out there, we've assembled a absolutely cracking lineup for you today, and I can't wait to hear the many discussions that are going to flow from these keynotes. Uh, as you will have seen, well, I hope you've seen, uh, the theme of the conference today is culture of innovation. And before we get into the conference proper and all of our wonderful speakers, I thought I'd invite you to pause with me for a few minutes and reflect on what a culture of innovation might look and feel like in our industry. To ask how would a culture of innovation be different to what we currently have and to speculate on what its characteristics might be and what conditions it might require to flourish. So to begin with, and perhaps this is the researcher in me coming out, we always have to ask why. To answer that question, I'm going to ask you to move to the side with me and break one of my cardinal rules. And that is to compare buildings to cars and the building industry to the auto industry. Now, in the past, I've been very wary of doing this and I've admonished many a PhD student for trying to do so because I feel like it's often been done without subtlety. And if you look at the, the whole history of this over 100 years, it's probably caused more harm than it's led to true learning. But I feel like in trying to spell out what a culture of innovation might be for building, it's useful to see what such a culture looks like in other industries, adjacent industries. So let's start here with the 1983 Ford Falcon. And I can tell you I've been waiting around 10 years to work out how to weave the 1983 Ford Falcon <laughs> into a talk, and I finally got it. So um, bingo. So I want to tell you a little story about this car. 40 years ago in 1983, my parents bought a new Ford Falcon. At the time, it cost the grand sum of $12,000. Now, adjusted for inflation, that's around $40,000, uh, $47,000 today. Now, I can't compare the cost of a new Ford Falcon because, sadly, they stopped making that wonderful vehicle in 2016. But when they did stop making it, it cost $26,000. In other words, in the last 40 years, that, that car's 30% cheaper, but with 33 years of continuous improvement and added features. And I'm going to venture that that 2016 model is much, much more efficient, safer, and convenient than its 1983 counterpart. And for argument's sake, I'm going to say today that it's twice as good. So you probably know where this is about to go. Let's talk about building. Let's take the average detached house in the suburbs of Melbourne in 1983. It cost around $300 a square metre to build that house. Let's zoom forward. Adjusted for inflation, that would be $1,150 today. So now I've got a room full of people from Melbourne, a room full of people in building. Anyone want to yell out a guess for what the average square metre cost of building a detached house in the uh, suburbs of Melbourne is? Two and a half, it's a little high, yeah? Rio, two and a half. Okay, well, uh, I, I thought Napier and Blakely were being a little conservative, but they have it at 2,000 a square metre. Um, but I should also say, don't quote me here, because tomorrow that's definitely going to be more expensive. What do you say, Phil? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, so head to head, we've seen a doubling of a cost and what do we have to say about quality? Uh, yeah, that's what, that's what I think too, a bit like, well, I'm not so sure about the quality. I mean, wrapping up, the car's 30% cheaper and twice as good, and the house has doubled the price and roughly the same quality because I feel like being generous today. Some people say I'm too negative. So how did the auto industry do it? You guessed it, innovation. They invested in R&D. They took their systems and processes and continually improved them. Kaizen, as our Japanese colleagues would say, industrialization, digitalization, investing in people and knowledge. And if you think of some of the greatest moments in the history of the auto industry, 
I'd ask you to recall Ford and the generation of the assembly line, Sloan at GM and the development of the product family, which then uh, went on to surpass Ford at that time, and then on to Teichi Ono and Eiji Toyota and the Toyota production system. An absolutely impressive list of innovation within the span of about 50 years. So what can we learn? Well, the advances pioneered in each of these chapters of innovation certainly provided a first mover advantage to the companies that development, that developed them. But eventually, the entire auto industry adopted these innovations. Another thing that you'll notice if you read the history of the auto industry is their patience. Now, granted, I don't think anyone ever referred to Henry Ford as being patient, but let's not forget it took a couple of decades uh, to develop that system. But I think it's a patience that's completely lacking in our own industry, which demands often risk-free solutions tomorrow. Quick wind, low-hanging fruit, that's what we're always asked to deliver. From the auto industry, one learns that innovation does not happen overnight, but it's a slow and methodical process. One that places equal value on developing the culture of that innovation and the people behind it, as Bronwyn mentioned, as much as any of the technical, material or procedural solutions themselves. So the results of this 100-year enterprise in the auto industry can be seen in my parents' 1983 Ford Falcon, 30% cost saving and a product of markedly superior quality. Now let's turn to a culture of innovation and building. First, and again, I apologise if the academic in me is coming out again, but we need to talk about what we mean when we say innovation. What are the markers of innovation? Novelty, yes. Creativity, yes. Problem solving, yes. All of these things. But innovation also requires more than inventiveness. Innovation requires uptake and application. And in our industry, that means, and researchers sometimes find this a dirty word, profit. If it's not profitable, it won't succeed. So it's important to note here when we reference innovation, we're not talking necessarily about crazy moonshot ideas that are 10 and 20 years away, but solutions that are much closer at hand. And I've got no doubt that one day there's going to be room for these big picture advances, but right now, many of the solutions that we need already exist. What they really need is translation and application in our industry which is why in the CRC you'll often hear us refer to the need for applied research. So finally, I'd also like to clear up a point about innovation that we often hear, and it relates to why we should pursue innovation. Certainly not for moral reasons, I would say to you. Not because innovation is somehow good and the status quo is bad, even though that is often the case, but because it should make the wheel go faster. It should make the unit cost drop, make customers more happy, and conserve more of our valuable resources, increasingly important. Culture of iteration. Try, try, and try again. Not just the lonely pilot or prototype, but at least three of them. Let's put an end to the uh, innovation orphan that we've all heard of. Oh, we did that 10 years ago and it didn't work. The building industry should pause, reflect, question, theorise, test, implement, and then do it all again. We also need to end this culture of exceptionalism in building. I think this is something we're probably all familiar with here. It's the, uh, that'll never work, or as I said before, we tried that, or that's not like building, or building's not like that. It's where the industry thinks we don't need innovation, or somehow we're incapable of it. Building, like other sectors, needs innovation, no exceptions. The culture of investing in R&D. This would be a culture where large companies would have standing R&D departments that are focused on what's around the corner. Governments could help private industry to take that leap by incentivising innovation, rather than by giving it a, a lip service and then privately rewarding companies for projects that show little to no innovation at all. Sadly, too common. A culture of risk-taking. 
Equal, equally important for a culture of innovation is to embrace a culture of failure. Now, I know this might sound ridiculous. Nobody sets out to pursue failure. But we need to try new, uh, new stuff. And guess what? It doesn't always work first time. So here it would be helpful if there were a safe space where it's OK to fail. And I think, in essence, that's what a CRC is. And in this safe space, we can pursue pilots and the much needed proof of concept projects that Bronwyn alluded to before with our lighthouse projects. And we can do that safely. But I do think we need help from governments to create this safe space and keep it going. A culture of what if, why not? Let's give it a go. A culture of what do we got to lose? A culture of I don't know the answer, let's find out. And not the uh, kind of toxic certainty as I've heard it referred to many times before that we often hear that we know the answer to all of these questions when we don't. A culture of aspiration where it's not, a, not what we're aiming at to be just okay but to be great, the best. To have an industry where young people can't wait to get involved because the work that they're going to do is meaningful, rewarding and engaging. A strong culture of innovation would help us to not only anticipate the shocks and cataclysms coming our way, but it would help us to respond better, to ramp production up and down, to adapt. In a context where we can be certain that there are going to be many more fires, floods and droughts, cyclones and earthquakes, we would have a plan in advance about what we're going to do about it. Innovation gives us levers to pull in those moments. And my last quality or condition, if you like, is a culture of consistency. And by consistency, I mean having the discipline to follow a methodical plan or strategy. And this is a really big challenge in our industry because of this, the cycle, as it's referred to. Now, I think this is something that's a little bit more pronounced than some of the other countries I've visited around the world, but it's something that has a huge impact on companies and our ability to innovate. I want to invite you to guess where it's most likely that innovation happens in this cycle. Is it A, B, C or D? Well. I would say, in my experience, it's tended to be D, yeah? At A, we're all too busy to innovate. At B, we're cost-cutting. And at C, there's not much money about and there's not much projects about. But when we see things starting to improve and we see a trajectory towards the future, that's when we start to innovate. But can everyone see here today how this is a problem? It's exactly when we need innovation to be able to flatten this cycle. So I would wrap up by saying that this is not the definitive list of the building industry's culture of innovation, but it's a start. And hopefully it goes some way to showing the difference between where we are and where we need to be in years to come. And hopefully events like this one and many others that the CRC will host in years to come can not only play a small part in building this culture of innovation, but importantly, also allow us to have some fun along the way. Thank you. Those of you who did not get a chance to meet Professor Andrea Shigu, she was the director and co-founder of MIT's Real Estate Innovation Lab, and sadly she passed away after a battle with cancer in December 2022. Andrea sat on our scientific advisory committee and I also had the pleasure to interview her on our podcast. Many of you would remember that Andrea presented to this conference last year, and you couldn't tell, but she was already very, very sick. It was one of the last presentations she did. Now, most people certainly would not have done that, but her energy and commitment pushed her through. And speaking with her partner, Daniel Fink, Last week in preparing for today, Daniel told me that she worked on it all day. 
and I urge you to watch that material which is on our YouTube site and to listen to others. It's obviously a tragedy to see someone like Andrea cut down in her prime, but I think it's also important we take the time to honour her and her achievements. Andrea's passing also reminds us that we perhaps should add another quality to the list I presented above, and that's a culture of honouring those who've pushed the industry forward. So I'd like to dedicate this year's conference to Andrea and pass on our condolences to her family and especially Daniel and her daughter, Atalia. My last and next task is a somewhat happier one and it is to uh, introduce you to my colleague, my wonderful colleague, uh, Professor Chris Knapp, who's the research director of Building 4.0 CRC, uh, who's going to go on and introduce our first speaker of the day, our first keynote speaker of the day. So with that, I want to thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the day. Um, that was a rather sad interlude, but I think important. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for that introduction, Matthew. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, just on Andrea, I, I had the real privilege of working with her as she developed that presentation that she gave and was able to introduce and, and help moderate the, uh, the conversation that surrounded her talk uh, and the co-panelists that she presented with last year and yeah, really found her to be um, quite brilliant. So I think it's, it's, um, it's rather touching to think of her and remember her today as, as Matthew um, has shared with us. So um, I really appreciate you, you doing that, Matthew.